It's difficult to describe the fervor for Donkey Kong Country when it was first released. This was the game that every kid was talking about, every kid was excited for, and we were all blown away by the graphics. None of us had ever seen anything like it up until that point, and the fact that I was even aware of it was a huge deal, as this was well before I got into the gaming scene through the magazines of the time. Donkey Kong Country was nothing short of an event, one that I couldn't take part in because my family had gotten a Sega Genesis. Now, don't get me wrong, I loved my Genesis. I played Sonic and Comic Zone and World of Illusion and so many others to death, but it didn't have Donkey Kong. So I begged my parents for a Super Nintendo and they didn't budge. I already had one game console, why did I need another? So I ended up not playing it until the Wii's Virtual Console. But in the meantime, I found an alternative. A little game that feels lost to time because barely anyone even talks about it. Donkey Kong Land. And that's a shame because this game is so much more than you might think it is. First things first, this is not a port. While it features some reused elements, there are new level themes, new baddies, new bosses, and even platforming mechanics. And that's because it's a kind of sequel to Donkey Kong Country where Donkey and Diddy find themselves being taunted by Cranky. The old ape claims the SNES game was only successful because of the fancy graphics, but the two claim that people loved it for the gameplay. To prove him wrong, DK accepts Cranky's challenge to let K. Rool take the banana horde again and get them back, but this time on the Game Boy. You know, Rare might have been a little put off by the critics claiming basically the same thing. All of this is only in the manual though. There's no story set up or even a small scene of DK bemoaning his missing bananas. Instead, you're plopped on the first world's map, Gangplank Galleon Ahoy, and off you go. And at first, it all seems like it's going to be just like the SNES game. It's a jungle theme, the level design feels like the Super Nintendo game, Rambi the Rhino makes an appearance, there's familiar enemies and bonus rooms to find, all while a Game Boy rendition of DK Island Swing plays. It feels like it should and looks pretty impressive considering this was on the original black and white Game Boy. In fact, this was one of the first games to take advantage of the Super Game Boy adapter to give it some extra color and definition. I don't own a Super Game Boy though, so all the footage is just as I experienced it as a kid. It's pretty shocking how similar it feels to the SNES original though. The movement is the same, though perhaps a little looser, DK and Diddy have the unique attributes of being strong and fast respectively, and the models are large and relatively detailed. It should be a pixely mess, and stills certainly convey that, but in motion, it works wonderfully. And while Super Mario Land opted to shrink the characters to ensure platforming could easily be seen, Donkey Kong Land finds another way to combat screen crunch while maintaining larger sprites. The Kongs are always placed just to the side of the center, allowing more room to see what's coming next. More importantly, when they turn to go in the opposite direction, the camera will shift to mirror the standard camera angle, but as the player is adjusting to the new view, DK or Diddy will be all the way next to the screen's edge. It's clever and only mildly disorienting in practice. I was able to swap between country and land with little issue, though inevitably there were times where I was blindsided or had to make a leap of faith. But for the most part, Rare found a way to make it all work. It makes sense too, as a small team of newcomers and vets of the original helped develop the game. Now, so far, this has all been pretty similar, but there are some changes that can be felt even in this first level. For one, DK and Diddy are no longer on screen at the same time, unsurprisingly. Two, there are these DK coins that are available to collect, but seem to have no use. I'll touch on those eventually as I jumped in and completely forgot what they did upon replaying this. Finally, the Kong letters have a completely different purpose. They're how you save the game. Miss a letter? Saving won't be happening. And later on, they could be well hidden with some only being found in bonus rooms. Thankfully, bonus rooms aren't as difficult to find as in Donkey Kong Country. I still had to be observant, but I pretty easily finished with a 75% completion rating. And trust me, like Country, there's no point going for 100% as there's no extra bonus or even a scene. It's just bragging rights. The bonus rooms themselves can be useful, but I'll save that for later. Because, after getting players acclimated to what seems like a simple handheld Donkey Kong adventure, BAM! Ice level! and it uses the assets of the ice levels from Donkey Kong Country, making it feel like I just jumped from level 1 to world 4. 
Ice physics are in place too, making it feel like one of the sharpest shifts I've ever encountered in a platformer. It's not actually that much harder, but it's almost psychological warfare if you're more familiar with the console game. The pits don't ramp up until the second half, providing plenty of time to get used to the ice and introduce a new enemy, a flying pig called Hogwash. It's not difficult, but again, it underlines just how different land is to country. Level 3 goes back to the jungle and is mostly focused on getting players accustomed to swinging on vines, but level 4 is where another curveball to longtime fans appears, especially nowadays. It's a Gangplank Galleon level, the first time the theme was playable in a Donkey Kong game as this was released 4 months before Donkey Kong Country 2 and even features the Gangplank Galleon theme. All the ideas players would expect from 2 are there as well. DK and Diddy must climb the ropes of the mast to get higher while dodging mini neckies and zingers along the way. It's not a hugely complicated level by any means, but it had to be something of a treat for those excited for the upcoming sequel. This level is also the first opportunity for players to discover Expresso, the only other animal friend besides Rambi to be featured in the game. He mostly works the same as in Country with his ability to glide over gaps, though with the added bonus of being able to jump on and defeat enemies, including Zingers. Expresso rarely appears in the levels themselves though, as he's usually relegated to bonus rooms. Level 4 does introduce one more element that wouldn't see a return until Donkey Kong Country 3. At the end of level 4 is a special bomb barrel that is picked up and stashed away. This can then be used to open one of two paths on the map, determining which level will be played next. It doesn't lock out the other one, but it does introduce a limited amount of world map interactivity that would get expanded upon in the final SNES game. It kind of originated right here. It's also possible to discover one more thing while working through the levels of World 1, and this finally explains what those DK coins actually do. There are certain bonus areas that can be found where a barrel will shoot out extra lives when a switch is hit. The amount of DK coins you've collected determines how many attempts you get at these lives, and if you're really good at it, you can easily fill up the bottom of the screen with hearts. They're great to have, especially as the game can get tricky as time goes on. But as for the rest of this first world, it mostly focuses on adding more ropes and barrels to the set themes and getting players acclimated to the rising challenge. There's not much to comment on until we reach the first boss, the completely unique Wild Sting, a flying manta ray that isn't even that much larger than Diddy and continually comes in from the sides. It's not really all that difficult, putting it in line with the bosses of Donkey Kong Country, but it does feature a boss theme that goes harder than you'd ever expect. This is the first example of a David Y song not being redone for the Game Boy and is instead composed by Graham Norgate, and every new song is fantastic. Seriously, have a sample. It's little wonder he would go on to do more at Rare, composing the soundtrack to Blast Corps and working with Robert Beanland on Killer Instinct, Goldeneye, and Jet Force Gemini. After Rare, he handled the soundtracks to the Time Splitters series and was the audio director on the Crisis Trilogy. It certainly pumps you up for such a basic boss. And really, that applies to all four of them. Giant Clam is a matter of positioning and reflection, while Hardhat is almost a warm-up for King K. Rule, whose boss battle is mostly the same as the SNES Showdown. With Wild Sting out of the way, World 2 brings the Kongs to Kremlantis, home to water levels, and the Temple and Coral level themes from Donkey Kong Country. There's not as much to note here as the game settles into its groove, but the underwater ruins are notable as this is where most of the new enemies in the game appear. Fangfish and Gloops aren't that different from standard water enemies, but the flappers do offer a challenge as they tend to be the biggest obstacles. Water levels in general have a different feel from the SNES game simply due to the lack of on guard. With no way to attack enemies, it's all about dodging. Kremlantis could feel the most like the SNES game, except the latter half of the world does add some fun twists to the formula. 
The swirl wind obstacles in the ruins offer up the biggest change, as they're harmful to touch from the sides, but can be bounced on from above. Each time they're featured, the focus is to adjust to the bounce to move forward, or find ways to not let them block the way to bonus rooms or extra goodies. They're just different enough to make them feel unique. In the same way, the new Nemo enemy in the Coral levels twists the gameplay just enough as the player must swim and avoid obstacles as fast as possible to stay ahead from most of the level. Certainly trickier without On Guard to help clear other enemies along the path or dash ahead. That brings us to World 3, Monkey Mountains and Chimpanzee Clouds, and is where the cave levels are placed, but there are two new themes featured here. The first is a mountainside that DK must climb while avoiding the occasional falling rocks. It's certainly the most vertical a level has been up to this point, but the truly standout theme are the clouds. Wild geometry, zingers everywhere, and needing to stick to platforms that follow airflow. This is where I felt the difficulty ramp up as a kid, and it was no different here. In fact, I was hit with a wave of nostalgia as I entered the second cloud level where the platform changed direction every time it hit a side or DK jumped. Managing my position while taking down enemies was hard enough, but there were moments that took me quite a while to figure out the jump timing to move forward. It was also around this time that I noticed that finding all the Kong letters was getting trickier. I often missed only one, meaning that I was still out of luck saving. Thankfully, lives are plentiful, but even finding all the bonus rooms was happening less often. I distinctly remember having a game over in this section as a kid and repeating levels just because I wasn't able to save. The game is short enough that it isn't a massive punishment, but it was frustrating having to do it over when I was younger. Thankfully, the final cloud level is a bit of a reprieve from the small platforms and allows Expresso to shine outside of a bonus room. However, I must say that arriving in World 4 as a kid gave me a bit of a thrill. One of my earliest games was Donkey Kong Classics on the NES, so I was familiar with the original arcade game. Really, there wasn't much to it, but there was something cool about DK returning to a city setting while playing him, and all the level themes were completely unique to boot. From exploring a construction site, to climbing a building, to running around inside a blimp, every level of Big Ape City feels wholly unique to Donkey Kong Land. Now, one of the common ideas floating out there is that Big Ape City would eventually become Mario Odyssey's new Donk City, as both claim to be the city that Donkey Kong originally kidnapped Pauline in. I find it somewhat doubtful that Nintendo intended the connection, but it's a fun tidbit at the very least. And Big Ape City is certainly where the platforming got more demanding with more enemies to deal with and smaller platforms to cross. The screen crunch was at its most notable here too, as I had to make more than a few leaps of faith. But I do have to commend the game as it always showed what was coming. There would be a glimpse as the platforms moved, but that was just enough to make the proper jump. It never reached the point of feeling unfair or frustrating. Then there's one of the more standout ideas when Kong letters need to be found before pressing a switch. They are then used as platforms to continue to the next area. It's a novel concept and not too out there considering the game has already featured literal flying pigs and platforming across clouds. It's not as grounded per se as Donkey Kong Country, but the inventiveness helps it form an identity. And seeing the levels use chains as ropes and flame barrels as dangerous platforms gives it almost more of a connection to its roots than the SNES game. Frankly, in terms of level design, Donkey Kong Land is pretty great across the board, introducing plenty of new ideas while emphasizing different aspects compared to its console counterpart. It's basically a companion piece, and that's something that just wasn't done at the time. Corners had to be cut and Game Boy ports tended to be just plain lesser. The appeal was in the portability, but Donkey Kong Land feels ambitious. 29 levels and 4 bosses compared to countries 33 and 7. The levels are just shorter overall. It also lacks extras since Cranky, Funky, and Candy are nowhere to be seen. Even defeating K. Rule feels uneventful as it immediately cuts the credits with no fake out ending or a crawl of all the enemies and characters in the game. It's just straight to the credits and then back to the title screen. And as I said before, 100% provides nothing extra. Thankfully, the core game is good enough that it really doesn't matter. Even beyond my own nostalgia, Donkey Kong Land is well worth playing a piece of Donkey Kong's legacy that few talk about, and it continued on as we got both Donkey Kong Land 2 and 3, which followed more closely to their console cousins. But perhaps I'll talk about those another time. For now, I'd love to hear about your experience with Donkey Kong Land. Have you played it before? Is this your first time hearing about it? 
let me know in the comments, and as always, please consider subscribing to Good Vibes Gaming, hitting the like button, and ringing that bell. We also have a Patreon at patreon.com slash gbgaming with plenty of extra perks. Until next time, bye!